Welcome back to the book of Hosea. Now we're going to take a look at the book verse by verse. This is when it really gets fun for me. I enjoy looking at the historical background and understanding what was going on in Hosea's day. Let's just remember that Hosea is prophesying mainly to the northern uh, part of Israel, to Israel. Judah is mentioned just a very few times in the book, and Hosea does have some things to say to Judah, but primarily this is a prophecy to the northern kingdom. And the Assyrians are looming on the horizon. In fact, they have already made some attacks on northern Israel, and Hosea is going to refer to them. But we're going to take a look at, and we're going to look at the whole book, and primarily the book is a book about judgment, coming judgment. But you know, even in the midst of coming judgment, God is a merciful God. And we're going to see the hand of God remaining upon Israel, even though the people are going to be conquered and they're going to be dispersed and they're going to disappear as far as the world is concerned from this day. Um, ultimately, 722 is the day for the final demise of the northern kingdom and the uh, the captivity and the dispersing of the ten, ten tribes among the nations, never to be seen again, even to this very day. But they will be seen. They will be back. In Revelation chapter 7, we read that God has set aside a remnant from each one of those ten nations, as well as Judah and Benjamin. And God is going to raise up witnesses in the end times for the purpose of the conversion of the house of Israel. Hosea is going to refer to that besides talking about the coming invasion of the Assyrians um, in the, in the mid-700s BC. Um, Isaiah's gonna, or Hosea is going to give us a, a, a view, a window, a little bit of insight into the end times, into a millennial time, and even into the repentance of Israel during the tribulation time, and the return of Israel uh, to the land even prior to the, uh, the tribulation time, or during the tribulation time as well. And so, we begin. I hope you have your Bible. I hope you have your Bible open to Hosea chapter 1. We could call Hosea the, um, the prophet of persevering love. Hosea wants us to know and God's people to know, Israel to know, that God's love perseveres. God brings discipline, and sometimes that discipline is a very harsh, harsh discipline, but God brings that discipline for the purpose of getting his people to return to him, even as Gomer was encouraged to return to Hosea, and when she came back, Hosea loved her, even while she was gone and suffering. Hosea loved her and cared for her. She didn't realize it. Israel doesn't realize it. We're going to see the correlation between Gomer and Hosea and Israel and God throughout these 14 chapters. Let's dive in, okay? Hosea means salvation. In fact, it's the same root word in the Greek as Joshua or Yeshua, from which we get Jesus. And so his name means salvation. Hosea 1.1 1, 1 and following, we're going to see an introduction here. And, and once we have the introduction of verse 1 behind us, then we're going to look at four characters. Basically, Gomer, his wife, Jezreel, um, his first son, Lo Ruhama, a daughter, and Lo Ami, a, um, a son. And, um, and so we'll see them in the, in the first chapter, the first nine verses. It says, The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, son of Beeri, during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and during the reign of Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, king of Israel. So we have our introduction here. We have the time frame that is be, being given to us. Really, the, the purpose of verse 1 is that we might understand Hosea is the prophet and this is the time frame from which he is prophesying. And so he goes into the story of his life, his marriage, and his family. And first of all, we're introduced to Gomer in verses 2 and 3. The word Gomer, interestingly enough, is a Hebrew word that means complete. And God is in the process 
of bringing Gomer to a completion within Hosea's love, but he's also in the process of bringing the nation of Israel into a completion of what God intended uh, Israel to be. You know, I think it's an interesting thing that sometimes today we talk about converted Jews or Messianic Jews. The real term for a Jew that becomes a Christian and a follower of Yeshua HaMashiach or Jesus the Christ is a completed Jew. When a Jew gets saved, they are a completed Jew. Now that, that, that doesn't mean God is finished with them yet, okay? But, but God is in the process of bringing his people to the point of completion, and the point of completion is the point of salvation. And so we read, first of all, in verses two and three, when the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, go take yourself an adulterous wife and children of unfaithfulness because the land is guilty of the vilest adultery in departing from the Lord. Immediately we see the correlation. Um, Hosea is to reach out to Gomer, who seems to be an adulterous wife, seems to be living in promiscuity even prior to him taking him uh, her on as his wife. And, and he is going to have children with her that are going to be uh, uh, children that are born out of wedlock. And it is a comparison between God and his love for Israel, who is an adulterous, idolatrous, unfaithful, wandering, promiscuous people. So verse 3 says, So he married Gomer, daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. Then Hosea, then the Lord said to Hosea, call him Jezreel, Jezreel, because I will soon punish the house of Jehu for the massacre at Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel. In that day, I will break Israel's bow in the valley of Jezreel. So there's an interesting thing here. We have a reference to Jezreel, and Jezreel was a place. Hosea is to name his first child, his first son, um, by this name. Jezreel means two things, and it means two things to the Jews. First of all, there's the meaning of the Hebrew word that means God sows or God plants. And God is planting a thing in Israel. We are going to see that unfold. And we're going to see Hosea refer to that uh, several times in his book. But the second thing, besides the meaning of the name, is the historical significance of this place, Jezreel. And, and uh, it was a place of judgment. It was a place of cruelty. It was a place of death. And, and so... Hosea is reminding Israel in, in a real way that they are Jezreel. God will punish the house. God will punish Israel. God will punish the house of Jehu for the massacre at Jezreel. And so we read a couple of things. But first of all, if you can flip over in your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 10. And just a quick reference, I'm going to let you do some of your study, a lot of your study on your own here, but it's fascinating to go back, and I recommend that you go back and, and read all of 2 Kings chapter 10. I'm really going to just refer you down to verse 11, and it says in verse 11, So Jehu killed everyone in Jezreel who remained of the house of Ahab, as well as his chief men, his close friends, and his priests, leaving him no survivor. So there was a tremendous massacre that took place in Jezreel. And the house of Jehu, Jehu was the king that followed Ahab. Now Ahab was evil. And you might wonder, well, why would anybody be punished for killing Ahab and all of his descendants? Because God is judge, not man. And God did not ask Jehu to step in and to do this. 
And so they are reminded this is a place of judgment. This is a place of massacre. And I will punish you. I will punish the house of Jehu. That's you, Israel. I will punish you and put an end to your kingdom, Israel. In that day, I will break Israel's bow in the valley of Jezreel. And so it says, Gomer conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. Then the Lord said to Hosea, call her Lo Ruhamah, for I will no longer show mercy to the house of Israel. Lo Ruhamah means unloved. I will no longer show mercy to you. Consider yourself unloved. Now God's going to qualify that because, because this is the prophet of persevering love. But sometimes it looks like God is not loving and certainly the judgment that the Assyrians are going to bring upon the nation of Israel appears to be a very unloving judgment. It says in, verse, um, in the middle of that verse 6, I will no longer show love to the house of Israel that I should um, at all forgive them. Yet I will show love to the house of Judah and I will save them. Not by bow, not by sword, and not in the battle. Not using horses and not using horsemen, but by the Lord their God. Isn't it not interesting that when you study First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, Joshua, Judges, that we see God bringing victory for his people without the efforts of his people. God does not need a mighty army in Israel or Judah to destroy the enemy. God is able to do what God wants to do, and he's able to do it by his own mighty hand. Now, if you still have your finger in 2 Kings, or even if you don't, if you turn back with me to 2 Kings chapter 19, because now we're looking at Judah. First, we looked at Israel and God's judgment because of what happened at Jezreel. Now, now we're going to look at at um at Judah and God showing love to the house of Judah. And in 2 Kings 19, and if you drop all the way down to verse 35, what we have here is Hezekiah is the king of Judah. He's a good king, king of the southern kingdom. And Hezekiah is at war. He's at war against these same Assyrians. And it says in verse 35, that night the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 men of the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, when Judah, the armies of Judah woke up the next morning, um, all they could see was dead bodies. So it says Sennacherib, king of Assyria, broke camp and withdrew, he retreated, and he returned to Nineveh, his, his capital city, and he stayed there. And, and so God brought a mighty, mighty victory to the house of Judah against the same enemy that is encroaching upon Israel, and God is going to allow this same enemy to bring judgment on the house of Israel. So we have, we have Jezreel, um, the, the son that talks to us of the, um, um, the judgment of God. We have Loruhamah, a daughter that is not pitied or a daughter that is not loved. And then in verse 8 it says, And after she weaned Loruhamah, Gomer had a, another son. Then the Lord said, Call him Loami. Now, um, notice that it says specifically Gomer had a son, okay? And, and it apparently is that this son is out of wedlock, at least out of the marriage that exists between her and Hosea. And the Lord said, call him Lo-Ami, for you are not my people. Wow, um, Jezreel, God sows, God judges. Uh, Lo-Ruhamah, not loved. Um, Lo ami, not my people. For you are not my people, and I am not your God. Now the reason that God was saying you're not my people is because they had not made God 
their God. They had prostituted themselves. They had lusted after the gods of the surrounding nations, even as God had told them not to do. Now, what's interesting is that right here at the beginning, in the midst of all this judgment, we still have the heart of God. There's places in my Bible where I have put a heart right in the text, especially in Hosea, because this is a, a book about the, the ju judging hand of God. But I don't ever want to forget that God judges out of love, that God judges, God disciplines for the purpose of bringing his people back into his heart, back into his fold, back into um, his relationship. And so it says in, in, in verse 10, yet the Israelites will be like the sand of the seashore, which cannot be measured or counted. That's covenant, folks. You see the covenant, God's covenant is mentioned in almost every book of the Bible, every book but one. And, it's, and here we have a reference to the covenant. You will be like the sand of the seashore. That's what God said to Abraham when he gave the eternal covenant, which cannot be measured or counted in the place where it is said to them, you are not my people. They will one day be called sons of the living God. This is a messianic promise. This is an end times promise. Verse 11, the people of Judah and the people of Israel will be reunited. The nations will come together again. They were split. We had Saul, David, Solomon. And after Solomon's death, the nation of Israel split into the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom, Israel, Judah, Jeroboam in the north, Rehoboam in the south, and one day they will come back together and God will have one people of the nation of Israel. Verse 11, the people of Judah and the people of Israel will be reunited and they will appoint one leader and will come up out of the land for great will be the day of Jezreel. Great will be the day that God sows. Um, say to your brothers, my people and your sisters, my loved ones. So we have the introduction to the book. Now in chapter two, we, we move into um, the reconciliation here and, and the comparison between Gomer and Hosea, Israel and God. And we have in verse 10, we really have the day when the people will be accepted. In verse 11, we have of, of chapter one that is, we have the day when the people will be reconciled in chapter 2 and verse 1, which really belongs to chapter 1, we have the people loved once again. And then when we go on into chapter 2, we have the description of an unfaithful wife um, and an unfaithful people and a redeeming husband and a redeeming God. And that's what chapter 2 is all about, is the redemption of Gomer and the redemption of Israel. And so it says, rebuke your mother, rebuke her. For she is not my wife, and I am not her husband. Let her remove the adulterous look from her faith and the unfaithfulness from between her breasts. This is a plea for restoration. It goes on. Otherwise, I'll strip her naked and make her as bare as on the day she was born. I will make her like a desert, turn her into a parched land and slay her with thirst. I will not show my love to her children because they are children of adultery. And so we have a plea for reformation and a plea for return. And in verse five then, we have the root of the whole problem. The root of the whole problem is harlotry. The root of the whole problem is Israel lusting and Gomer lusting after another lover says, verse 5, their mother has been unfaithful. Oh, how unfaithful Israel was. They worshipped the god of Baal. They worshipped the goddess Ashtoreth. They worshipped the god Moloch. They worshipped um, every god from the surrounding nations. They set up shrines and temples and high places of worship for all of these gods. And they lusted after and gave credit to false gods for the blessing that Yahweh God had given to them. And, and it says in verse five, their mother has been unfaithful. She said, I will go after my lovers who give me my food. You see the root of the problem? 
Verse 5, their mother has been unfaithful. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. The root problem in the whole world is unfaithfulness to God. The root problem in America is unfaithfulness to God. The root problem in Israel today is unfaithfulness to God. The root problem in our lives is unfaithfulness to God. Now, I'm not saying that you're all unfaithful to God, but here's what I'm saying. When we stray from God, we stray from God's blessing. Like a child who comes under the discipline of a father, those who stray from God subject themselves to the discipline of our Heavenly Father. And it says, look, in the middle of verse 5, she said, I will go after my lovers who give me food and they give me my water. Wow, in the New Testament, Jesus says, God gives the sun. God gives the rain. God produces the abundance. Israel had been promised this way back when they were in the desert. Be faithful to me and I will give you abundance. Now they have abundance. And remember, many of these people in the Northern Kingdom, in the cities, were quite wealthy right now at this particular time in history. And they're giving credit to these false gods for everything they have. My wool, the product from sheep, my linen, my oil, the olive groves, my drink, the, the, the grapevines. Therefore, I will block her path with thorn bushes. I will wall her in. This is God's discipline. I will wall her in so that she cannot find her way. She will chase after her lovers, but she won't catch them. Uh, Hosea is saying there's a day that she's actually going to go after these false gods, specifically asking for mercy, and she's going to go after even the nation that's about to conquer them and not find mercy. She will look to them, but not find them. Then she will say, I will go back to my husband as at first, for then I was better off than now. And we see, you know what? We see in the history of Israel, and look at the book of Judges. We see Israel sinning. Israel repenting. God bless them. Israel sinning. God judges. Israel repents. God blesses. Israel sins. God judges. Israel repents. So back and forth, back, they're insincere in their repentance. But the purpose of discipline is seen right there in the latter part of verse 7. Then she will say, I will go back. God is going to bring a harsh and horrendous discipline on the nation of Israel during the tribulation time. The purpose of it is that Israel might repent, that Israel might come back to God as their one and only husband and conclude it's there that I'm better off. Now, in Gomer's time, she came back, but she would depart. She would come back because she was better off like the prodigal son. But in her case, she wasn't sincere and she would depart again. It says in verse 8, she has not acknowledged that I was the one who gave her the grain and the new wine and the oil, who lavished on her the silver and the gold um, which they used for Baal. God's the one that gave wealth. And then they turned around and they used that wealth um, for their worship of Baal and other false gods and false religions. So in verses 9 through 12, we, we really kind of have the, um, the nature of discipline. The root of the problem is in verse 5, harlotry. The discipline of the harlot is seen in verses 6 through 13. Um, the, the, um, the hope is given to us in verses 6 through 8, but the nature of the discipline is given in verses 9 through 12. And it says in verse 9, Therefore I will take away my grain when it ripens and my new wine when it is ready. I will take back my wool and my linen intended to cover her nakedness. So discipline number one is God withholding the needs and the pleasures of Israel. Discipline number two is revelation. Wow, sometimes to be have truth revealed to you can be very hurtful 
and God is going to reveal truth to them. And it says in verse 10, so now I will expose her lewdness before the eyes of her lovers. No one will take her out of my hands. An exposure, an exposure of her hypocrisy. In verse 11, we have the cessation of her festivals. You know, Israel, even when Israel lusted after other gods, mixed it, and we're going to see that in a couple of chapters, mixed it with the religion and the worship of false gods. And so even now, even though they're, they're lusting after Baal, they're still going to, to celebrate their, um, their, their celebrations um, every year, the high holy days. Now they didn't go to, the northern kingdom didn't go to Jerusalem to do that. They had set up their own place in Bethel, okay? And then in other high places, but they would still celebrate all of the new moons, the, the yearly festivals, the Sabbath days and all of that. And so it says, I will stop it. I will stop these celebrations. And when Israel is carried off into disbursement by the Assyrians, these celebrations came to an end and they have remained at an end for them until this very day. I will stop her celebrations, her yearly festivals, her new moons, her Sabbath days, all her appointed feasts. And then in verse 12, we have the destruction of the harlot's wages. And it says, I will ruin her vines and her fig trees, which she said were her pay for her lovers. She's using the profit from the vines and the fig trees in order to continue her harlotry, her worship of these false gods. I will make them a thicket. Wild animals will come in and devour them. And so then in verse 13, we have the reason for the discipline uh, being religious prostitution. I will punish her for the days she burned incense to the Baals. She decked herself with rings and jewelry. She went after her lovers, but me she forgot, declares the Lord. Israel, now I'm talking about the northern kingdom, to this very day is continuing in that discipline, being punished by God, having disappeared it to us from the face of the earth. So God goes on with a therefore, and we have here then the betrothal of an unfaithful wife. Therefore, I, I am go now going to allure her. I will lead her into the desert and speak tenderly to her. Then I will one day give back her vineyards and I will make the valley of Achor a door of hope. Achor kind of sounds like Achan. And if you remember Joshua, when he led the nation of Israel into the promised land, first of all, they conquered Jericho. But when they went up to Ai, there was sin in the camp. Achan stole what belonged to God, hid it. And as a result, he was punished for that. And it's saying, I will give her back her vineyards and I will make her the valley of Achor, a door of hope in the midst of sin, in the midst of disobedience, in the midst of rebellion, you will become a door of hope once again. And there she will sing as in the days of her youth, as in the day that she came up out of Egypt. Remember their song in Exodus? Um, um, the Lord has delivered us triumphantly the horse and rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord, my God, my strength, my shield. And now he is my victory. They sang that to the Lord when they came out of Egypt. And God says, one day you will sing again. One day you will rejoice in your relationship with me. And so then with that, that leads us into a messianic promise here once again. And it says, in that day, declares the Lord, you will call me husband. You will no longer call me my master. By the way, the Hebrew word master is Baal. And so Hosea is saying there is coming a day, a messianic day, a messianic promise, when you will call me my husband. Israel will look at God and say, my husband. 
not my Baal, not my master. Baal was a cruel master. God is a loving husband. That's the message of Hosea. I will remove the names of the Baals or the masters from her lips. No longer will their names be invoked. In that day I will make a covenant with them, with the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the creatures that move along the ground, bow and sword and battle I will abolish from the land so that they may all lay down in safety. Do you see the messianic promise there? Verse 19, I will betroth you to me forever. Three times we have the word betroth here. I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you in righteousness and justice, in love and compassion. I will betroth you in faithfulness, and you will acknowledge the Lord. In that day, I will respond, declares the Lord. I will respond to the skies, and they will respond to the earth. The earth will respond to the grain, the new wine, and the oil, and they will respond to Jezreel, to God's planting. So God says, I'm going to open up the heavens and it's going to rain. I'm going to touch the earth and it's going to produce. And you will have new grain and new wine and new oil, and it will be God who has planted these things for you. He says, I will plant her for myself in the land. I will show my love to the one I called, not my loved one. I will say to those called, not my people, you are my people. And they will say, you are my God. What a glorious day that will be. A messianic promise. Chapter 3 fascinates me. Chapter 3 really talks about redemption, purification, and restoration. But I liken Hosea chapter 3, uh, as short as it is, I, there's only five verses in this chapter. I liken it to Daniel's 70 weeks. I think you'll, you'll know what I mean when I take you through this, but let's take a look at it. It says, The Lord said to me, Go, show your love to your wife again. Though she is loved by another and is an adulteress, love her as the Lord loves Israel, the Israelites, though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes. Raisin cakes was part of worship of Baal, but especially a big part of worship of Ashtoreth, okay? And, and so they loved the raisin cakes. You know, they, why, why weren't they loving the sacrifices that they were giving to God, the sweet smelling savor that came from those sacrifices and they were able to eat and enjoy the sacrificial meat, much of the sacrificial meat that they gave to God? No, 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 no. They fell in love with the raisin cakes, with the raisin cakes of Ashtoreth worship. And so it says, so in verse two, I, Hosea, bought her, Gomer, for 15 shekels of silver. That's half the price of a slave. Half the price. And about a homer and a lethic of barley. And, and by the way, that's animal food. That was animal food. And then I told her, you are to live with me many days and you must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man, and I will live with you. Now look at this. Look at this, folks, because this is, this is fascinating to me. Oh, I love this. This goes right along with Daniel 70 weeks. This goes right along with Paul's restoration of the nation of Israel. Look at, look at the, the, the time frame. Look at the history that is being laid out here in two verses. For the Israelites will live many days without a king. Who's the king of Israel today? They don't have one. Or even a prince to ascend to the throne. They will live without sacrifice or sacred stones, without ephod or idol. Okay? And so basically, there's going to be a period of time when Israel does not live in idolatry. Today, Israel does not live in idolatry. But they don't have an ephod because they don't have a high priest. And because they don't have a high priest, they don't have sacrifices, and they don't have a king, and they don't have anyone ascending to the throne. We're looking at the present age of Israel. 
And the present age of Israel really started in 722 and goes to this very day. But then look what it says, verse 5, afterwards the Israelites will return and seek the Lord their God. That's what Paul talks to us about in Romans 10. That's what we see going on in the book of the Revelation during the tribulation time, the seven years. We see Israel returning to God, coming back to the land, began in 1948 and even before returning to the land, but especially becoming a nation, becoming a people under God again, seeking the Lord their God, no other idols. And then it says, so we have the present state, we have the future return, and, 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 and then we have the messianic, um, um, they will come trembling to the Lord and to his blessings in the last days. Wow, we have the presence of, of Israel, we have the future, but we have the end times as well. And so in chapter 4, and I got to tell you, chapter 4, um, I just stopped one day and I looked at this and I was just like totally amazed at what God was laying out in chapter 4 because it's so applicable to what's going on in America today. Um, take a look at these verses with me and you're going to be amazed, I, I hope. Hear the word of the Lord, you Israelites, because the Lord has a charge to bring against you. God calls Israel into court. God calls Israel before himself the judge. And he says there are charges. Charges to bring against you who live in the land. And, he's, and so essentially God convenes a court here in chapter 4 through chapter 5 and verse 15. And these are court proceedings. And, and so God says, essentially, you have broken the Ten Commandments. He says, and look at verse um, 1 in the middle of it. There is no faithfulness. There is no love. There is no acknowledgement of God in the land. There is only cursing, lying, murder, stealing, and adultery. They break all bounds, and bloodshed follows bloodshed. Because of this, the land mourns, and all who live in it waste away. The beasts of the field, and the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea are dying. Do you see this? Do you see this? Look at what we have. God convenes a court, and God brings the charges against Israel, and the charge essentially is apostasy. You have forsaken God. There's no faithfulness, no love, no acknowledgement of God in the land. Now what has replaced that? Well, look at this. There's only cursing, lying, murder, stealing, adultery, breaking all bounds, bloodshed follows bloodshed. Folks, I look at that. And I see the, the cause of the problem is that they, is their apostasy, they've forsaken God. The result of the problem is, is anarchy. Anarchy, rioting, bloodshed, murder, stealing, sexual immorality. All laws are broken. They break all bounds. They break all laws. Okay, we have apostasy that leads to anarchy. And what is the result? Because of this, the land mourns. And all who live in it waste away. The beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea are all dying. Do you see a correlation here? Do you, do you see what's going on in the world today? There is number one apostasy in the world today. 
Apostasy is what has led to anarchy in the streets of America and around this world. And then we have everybody, not everybody, but we have all these scientists, people, um, saying, what's wrong with the environment? We have destroyed the environment. But their conclusion for how we've destroyed the environment is fracking, burning fossil fuels, too many cows on the plains of America. No, God says, you know, you got it right. There's environmental problems. You're experiencing the anarchy, but you're missing where it came from. It came from your apostasy. I think in America, there was a time when America loved God, loved the church, respected God, and built our laws on Judeo-Christian principles. And then we, for, we forsook God. And the forsaking of God has led to anarchy in our streets, and it's not coming to an end. And it's led to environmental problems. And here it's laid out for us 2,750 years ago by the prophet Hosea. And he's, he's referring this to Israel. But I think there's, there's the meaning that Israel has. But I think there's the application that we see going on in the world today. And so he goes on in verse 4 and he says, But let no man bring a charge. Let no one accuse another. For your people are like those who bring charges against the priest. Well, he's saying no one can bring a charge. You know why? Because you're all guilty. You're all guilty of the same thing. You can't call someone a liar, you're a liar. Can't call someone a murderer, you're a murderer. You can't call someone a thief, you're a thief. You're just like the people that bring charges against the priests. Yeah, the priests are guilty, so are you. You stumble day and night, and the prophets stumble with you. Even the prophets have gone the wrong way. So I will destroy your mother. The mother is Israel, the nation. My people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. And God is saying, really, that's your past. You're already destroyed. The present, because you have rejected knowledge, the cause, I also reject you as my priest. Because you have ignored the law of your God, the future, I will ignore your children. God is pronouncing judgment on the nation today and tomorrow because of their apostasy. Verse 7, the more the priests increase, the more they sinned against me. And they exchanged their glory for something disgraceful. You know what? The priests of old in Israel became priests that led the people in the false worship of Baal, Ashtoreth, and other gods. And, and so the priests were just as guilty and the prophets became prophets of false gods. Verse 8, they feed on the sins of my people and relish their wickedness. Verse 9, and it will be like people, like priests. I will punish both of them for their ways and repay them for their deeds. Now look at the effect. They will eat, but they won't have enough. They will engage in prostitution, but they won't flourish as a people because they have deserted the Lord to give themselves to sex, to prostitution, to alcohol, to old wine and new, which take away the understanding of my people, and to idols. They consult a wooden idol and are answered by a stick of wood. Wow, sex, alcohol, and idolatry. A spirit of prostitution leads them astray and they are unfaithful to their God. That is the root of the problem, apostasy. A spirit of prostitution. You know what, I think we can read that an evil spirit has possessed the people. This is Satan's work, this is the devil's work. Verse 13, they sacrifice on mountaintops and burn offerings on the hills under Oak Popular and Terebinth where the shade is pleasant. See, they've gone to high places. God told them where to worship. God told them to worship in Jerusalem. No, no, they've gone to their high places on the mountaintops because they think it makes them closer to their gods that they have made of stone and wood. They burn offerings on the hills, but they do it under the trees because they want to do it where it's shady. 
Therefore, your daughters turn to prostitution and your daughters-in-law to adultery. So, God says, this is what's going to happen. I will punish your daughters when they turn to prostitution. I will, excuse me, I will not punish your daughters. It's like Romans 1. People desired and God gave them over. And they desired worse and God gave them over. And they desired worse and God gave them over. Three times in Romans 1, God gave them over is quoted there. So I'll not punish your daughters when they turn to this, nor your daughters-in-law when they commit adultery, because the men themselves consort with harlots. Why should I punish the women? The men are just as bad. And so sacrifice with shrine prostitutes, they make it part of their worship. A people without understanding will come to ruin. And by the way, that's an understanding of God. God's word. God's laws. God's ways. And then we have a word to Judah. Though you commit adultery, O Israel, let not Judah become guilty. Do not go to Gilgal, do not go up to Beth Aven, and do not swear as surely as the Lord lives. What's that all about? Well, Gilgal is where the standing stones were when Israel crossed the Jordan and came into the Promised Land. Remember, each of the tribes took a stone out of the Jordan and they set up 12 stones. It was the place of remembering the mighty hand of God. Don't bother going to Gilgal. Don't even go to beth Aven. By the way, that's Beth-El, the house of God. But Beth-El, God changed the name to beth Aven the house of wickedness. That's where the calves were that they worshipped. The northern kingdom had set up a place in Bethel and they went there to worship Yahweh. But they were worshipping Yahweh in the wrong way. The right God in the wrong way. And don't swear as surely as the Lord lives. The Israelites are stubborn. Like a stubborn heifer. How then can the Lord pasture them like lambs in a meadow? And Ephraim is stupid. <laughs> So, so the Israelites are stubborn and the Israelites are stupid. Ephraim, northernmost tribe in Israel, is joined to their idols. Leave them alone. Even when their drinks are gone, they continue their prostitution. Their rulers dearly love shameful ways. A whirlwind will sweep them away and their sacrifices will bring them shame. And the whirlwind will be the Assyrians who will come down, sweep across the land, and Israel will be carried away. So we come to chapter 5. And in chapter 5, basically, what the prophet is telling us is this condition is incurable. Okay, it's incurable. And, and we read, hear this. It's a, it's a message to the leaders to start out with. Uh, the incurable condition. Hear this, you priests. Pay attention, Israelites. Listen, O royal house. This judgment is against you. You have been a snare at Mitzpah, a net spread out at Tabor. Now, Mitzpah was a, a, a place called Watchtower. And Israel was to be watchmen against the enemy, against the evil one, against sinfulness, against unfaithfulness. But they've snared their people instead of being a watchtower for Israel. They spread out a net at Tabor, a place that overlooked the sea. The rebels are deep in slaughter. I will discipline all of them. I know. By the way, Tabor means choice. And it also means purity. And so it says, I will spread out a net at your place of choice, at your place of purity. I'm going to gather you in for punishment. The rebels are deep in slaughter. I will, I will discipline all of them. I know all about Ephraim. Israel's not hidden from me. Ephraim, you have now turned to prostitution. Israel is corrupt. Their deeds do not permit them to return to God. They are in love with their deeds, and their love with their deeds make them hostile toward God. A spirit of prostitution is in their heart, and they, acknowledge, they do not acknowledge the Lord. Israel's arrogance testifies against them. Their pride 
The Israelites, even Ephraim, stumble in their sin. Judah stumbles with them. Now, these are earlier stages of Judah's sin. But Israel is still, I mean, Judah is still stumbling too. They're on the way. The northern kingdom will be destroyed in 722. The southern kingdom will be led into captivity from 605 to, um, to 586 AD, uh, BC, BC. Verse, um, verse 6 talks about their worthless sacrifices. When they go out with their flocks and herds to seek the Lord, because remember, they still worship Yahweh, they worship Baal, they worship everybody. But when they go out with their flocks and herds to seek the Lord, they're not going to find him because he has withdrawn from them. And then their faithful, faithlessness, verse 7, they are unfaithful to the Lord. They give birth to illegitimate children. Now their new moon festivals will devour them and their fields. And we have a reference again to the coming Assyrian invasion, 722 B.C. So the sentence is pronounced. They're in court. Here's the sound, the trumpet. Da 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 da. This is the sentence. In Gibeah, the horn of Ramah, height, the height. Raise the battle cry in Beth Aven, the house of evil. Lead on, O Benjamin. Ephraim will be laid waste on the day of reckoning or the day of rebuke. Among the tribes of Israel, I will proclaim what is certain. Judah's leaders are like those who move boundary stones. I will pour out my wrath on them like a flood of fire. That's going to be 605 as they've moved their boundary stone or lowered their bar. Um, it, it, is a, um, um, it is a saying, a, 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 a Hebrew saying to move the boundary stones. We would say it's a lowering of the bar. And, and as a result of that, I will pour out my wrath on them like a flood of water. Ephraim is oppressed, the northern kingdom, trampled in judgment, intent on pursuing idols. I am like a moth to Ephraim, like rot to the people of Judah. When I was a boy, a lot of clothes were still being made out of wool. And I always remember when I would go to my grandparents' house, the whole house, especially when you open the closet doors, smelled like mothballs. Well, moths eat and destroy. Rot eats and destroys. God says, I'm like a moth to Ephraim. I'm like rot to the people of Judah. And so then look at their attempt, attempts to get help. Okay, they're in big trouble. And they know that they're in big trouble. So what do they do about it? Verse 13, when Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah's swords, then Ephraim turned to Assyria. Assyria is the enemy. Assyria is who God is using to bring sudden, mighty, permanent destruction upon the nation of Israel. But they turn to Assyria as the one that they think is going to give them aid and help them through this. They sent to the great king for help. He's not able to cure you. He's not able to heal your sores. I will be like a lion to Ephraim, a great lion to Judah, tearing them to pieces. I will tear them to pieces and then I'll go away. I'll carry them off and leave them no one to rescue them. Then I will go back to my place until they admit their guilt. And God is awaiting that to this very day. And then we have a millennial statement. If they will seek my face in their misery, they will, excuse me, they will seek my face in their misery. They will earnestly seek me. So we come to chapter six. And chapter six is God's desire to heal the people. Um, in, in this chapter, um, God wants them to come back. And God calls out to them. Come, let us return to the Lord. Well, um, at least the people are saying that. The people come to that conclusion. Let us return. Maybe we should go back. We're in bad trouble. Things are not going very well for us. But we're really seeing their insincere cry. Their insincere battle cry. Um, God has a desire to heal them, but they don't have a genuine desire to come back to him. And so... They're saying, hey, let's go back to God. 
He tore us to pieces, but he'll heal us. He's injured us, but he'll bind up our wounds. And then they're saying, you know, after two days, he'll revive us. On the third day, he'll restore us. That way we live in his presence. Oh, if we just call out to God, he'll come to our rescue. But God has already pronounced his judgment. And so verse 3 let us acknowledge the Lord. Let us press on to acknowledge him. As surely as the sun rises, he'll appear. He'll come to us like winter rains, like spring rains that water the earth. And God says, verse 4, What can I do with you, Ephraim? What can I do with you, Judah? Your love, or what you just said, your calling out to me, is like the morning mists, mist, like early dew. It just disappears. How often my wife and I wake up here in this part of Texas. We look out in the morning and we wonder if it's going to rain. Because there's, it seems dark, cloud, fog. But it's just the early morning humidity. And then as the sun rises, the mist is gone, the dew is gone. And that's the way their love for God was. Oh, we'll call out to him, but he'll rescue us and then we'll be right back, the people that we were. Why? Because their hearts have not changed yet. Verse 5, Therefore I cut you in pieces with my prophets. I kill you with the words of my mouth. My judgments flash lightning upon you, for I, will, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I don't, I don't want your sacrifices. I want your heart. I desire acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. Like Adam, they have broken the covenant, and there are lasting effects of that. They were unfaithful to me there. Gilead, Gilead was a city of refuge. It's wicked. It's a city of wicked men. Everybody's gone to Gilead, but Gilead wasn't just a place where wicked men could hide. Gilead was a place where people who had broken a law or been accused of breaking a law could get fair trial. But there is no fair trial, just a collection of wicked men. Gilead's a city of wicked men stained with footprints of blood. As marauders lie in ambush for a man, so do bands of priests. Well, inconsistency. On the one hand, they're not punishing the wicked in Gilead, but on the other hand, they lie in ambush. The priests even lie in ambush. They murder on the road to Sheshem. That was the first capital city of Israel, committing shameful crimes. Conclusion to this, I have seen a horrible thing in the house of Israel. There Ephraim is given to prostitution and Israel is defiled. As for you, Judah, a harvest is appointed. That's where the chapter should end. Um, your chapter 7 verse 1 m might begin just a little bit later but first of all um, we have the new chapter that really begins with the end of verse 11 wherever I would restore the fortunes of my people excuse me whenever I would restore the fortunes of my people whenever I would heal Israel the sins of Ephraim are exposed and the crimes of Samaria revealed Whenever I would heal, whenever I would heal them, the sins are exposed. The crimes are revealed. They go right back. They practice deceit. They resist. Thieves break into houses. Bandits rob in the streets. They don't realize that I remember all their evil deeds. Their sins engulf them. They are always, always before me. We have the moral depravity from the king right on down. Look at it. It says, They delight the king with their wickedness, the princes with their lies, the king's sons. They're all adulterers, burning like an oven, whose fire the baker need not stir from the kneading of the dough till it rises. On the day of the festival of our king, the princes become inflamed with wine. 
and he joins hands with the mockers. They just drink, and he joins them, and they mock. Their hearts are like an oven. They approach him with intrigue. Their passion smolders all night. In the morning it blazes like a flaming fire. All of them are hot as an oven. They devour. They devour the rulers. And their kings fall. And none of them call on me. Wow, we have national disaster that's going on here. National disaster. In, in, in chapter 7, basically we have the disillusion determined by senseless politics and an adulterated gener um, religion. And the kings and the princes and the rulers are all going right along with it. And so Hosea basically describes now Israel and uses um, three specific terms. Number one, Israel is like a pancake or a hot cake. Number two, Israel is like a trap bird. And number three, Israel is like a faulty bow. And so he's going to talk about these three things. Take a look at what he says. Verse, where am I? Verse 8. Ephraim mixes with the nations. Mixes. Remember I talked about that earlier. Mixes. We've mixed these religions together. Ephraim mixes with the nations. Ephraim is like a flat cake, not turned over, cooked on one side, raw on the other. You're not done. You're not complete. You can only be complete when you come into the surrender of God and today to recognize Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ. Ephraim is like a hot cake, not flipped over. Foreigners sap up his strength, but he doesn't realize it. He's, re he's relying on foreigners to be, to be a savior. But the foreigners are sapping his strength. His hair is sprinkled with gray, mixed, salt and pepper. And he doesn't even notice that. Wow. Israel is mixed, mixed with the nations. Like a hot cake, mixed, cooked on one side, raw on the other. Like salt and pepper hair, mixed, gray and dark. Like a nation relying upon other nations instead of God. Strength mixed with weakness. Verse 10, Israel's arrogance testifies against him, but despite all this, he does not return to God or search for him. So that's the first analogy, like a hotcake, mixed. Then we have the analogy of like a dove, like a trapped bird, okay? But it's the word dove. Ephraim is like a dove, easily deceived and senseless. Now calling to Egypt. Now turning to Assyria. See, in ancient times, they actually trapped birds. We go out and shoot them. They didn't have guns. They would trap them. Ephraim is like a dove, easily deceived, easily lured, senseless. Calling out to Egypt, come help us. Calling out to Assyria, come help us. When they go, I will throw my net over them. I will pull them down like birds from the air. We're talking about Israel. When I hear them flocking together, I'll catch them. Woe to them because they have strayed from me. Destruction to them because they have rebelled against me. I long to redeem them, but they speak lies against me. Oh, the heart of God there. I long, long to redeem this evil adulterous, rebellious people. I love you. But you speak lies against me. God doesn't help us. God doesn't love us. God doesn't care about us. Verse 14, they do not cry out to me from their hearts, but wail upon their beds. They gather together for grain and new wine, but they turn away from me. I trained them and strengthened them, but they plot evil against me. They don't even acknowledge that I am the God who can deliver them. They don't acknowledge that I am the God of the grain, that I am the God of the new wine. They've just turned away from me. Verse 16, they do not turn to the Most High. They are like a faulty bow. The third thing, so they're like a hot cake, not flipped over. They're like a dove, easily trapped, and they're like a faulty bow. So what's a faulty bow? Well, it would be like a, a gun that would misfire, a bad shell or bullet. They have a bow, 
and they think their bow can defend them, but they have a faulty bow. They do not turn to the Most High. They're like a faulty bow. Their leaders will fall by the sword. It's not your strength. It's not your military. It's not your weapons. It's not your ability, and it's not your training. Their leaders fall by the sword because of their insolent words. For this they will be ridiculed in the land of bondage. Bondage, Egypt. It's being used figuratively there. Assyria is going to carry them away. But they're going into bondage once again. And so we come to chapter 5. And chapter 5 really divides into, I mean, excuse me, chapter 8 divides into five sections. And it says, put the trumpet to your lips. And then we have an eagle. An eagle is over the house of the Lord. Because the people have broken my covenant. Huh, I wonder what the people do that think the eagle, when it's talked about in scripture, is America coming to the rescue. No. God is not saying America is coming to your rescue. God is saying there's an eagle hovering over your house. The people have broken my covenant. They rebelled against my law. Israel cries out to me, O our God, we acknowledge you. But Israel has rejected what is good, and therefore an enemy will pursue them. What's that telling us? The eagle is the enemy. An eagle is hovering overhead. You know, when I lived in Alaska, and you watch the eagle soaring, and pretty soon an eagle will swoop down across the water, reach down with his talons, grab a fish, and off it goes. And it can do that on land with small animals as well. The eagle is the one hovering over you, about to reach down and snatch you away. You've broken my covenant. That's crime number one. Crime number two, verse four. They have set up kings without my consent. This, we're talking about the northern kingdom now. The southern kingdom, the kingly line, is a Davidic line. The northern kingdom, in these last years of the northern kingdom, there have been six kings in a 25-year period. They ascend to the throne by assassinating each other. They come in, they're assassinated, and someone else takes their place. They set up kings without God's consent. They've chosen princes, or the next one in line, without my approval. When they're silver and gold, with their silver and gold, with which they think they're rich, they use that to make idols for themselves. And so we have a broken covenant. We have kings that are not God's kings. And then we have idols that worship false gods. They make idols for their their own destruction. Throw out your calf idol, O Samaria. Remember Bethel. They set up the calf idol. Originally there was two, one in the north, one in the south of the northern kingdom. But Bethel has become the prominent place. Dan is no more. And they throw out the calf idol. My anger burns against them. How long will they be incapable of purity? They're from Israel, this calf. A craftsman has made it. It's not God. It will be broken into pieces, that calf in Samaria. Your idol is helpless. It is not Yahweh. It is not your redeemer. It's not your husband. It says they sow the wind and they reap the whirlwind. Wow. They think, oh, a little wind is good. But they don't realize they're getting a hurricane. They're getting a tornado. The stalk has no head. It produces no flower. There's no grain. Were to yield grain, foreigners would swallow it up anyway. Israel is swallowed up. She is now among the nations like a worthless thing. God intended Israel to be a light to the Gentiles, a star among the nations of earth. And Israel turned themselves into a worthless thing. For they have gone up to Assyria, the enemy, and this is crime number four, like a wild donkey wandering alone, Ephraim has sold herself to lovers. 
So we have four crimes so far. We have, they've broken the covenant. They set up kings that were not approved by God. They made idols. And they turned to Israel, or to, to Assyria as their helper. It says in verse 10, although they have sold themselves among the nations, I will gather them together. They will begin to waste away under the oppression of the mighty king. And then the fifth thing, their altars. Though Ephraim built many altars for sin offerings, they have become altars for sinning. I wrote for them the many things of my law, but they regarded them as something alien. I told them how to worship. They say they're building these altars so they can worship me. They're not worshiping me. They have their altars. They have their sacrifices. They have their shed blood. That's not my worship. That's not the worship I ordained for you, my people. This is just an altar where you sin more. Verse 13, they offer sacrifices giving, given to me. They eat the meat, but the Lord is not pleased with them. No, he will remember their wickedness and punish their sins and they will return to Egypt. Not Egypt literally, the place of bondage. Israel has forgotten his maker and built palaces. Judah has fortified many towns, but I will send fire upon their cities and they will consume their fortresses. So chapter eight gives us five crimes. Broken covenant, false kings, idols, a relying on Assyria, false altars. Chapter 9 gives us five punishments. Let's take a look at that. It says, do not rejoice, O Israel. Don't be jubilant like the other nations. For you have been unfaithful to your God you love the wages of a prostitute at every threshing floor. By the way, the, the, the meaning there is you, you, you're making your money and then you're using it to worship other gods. Verse 2, threshing floors and wine presses will not feed the people. The new wine will fail them. Here's punishment number or judgment number one. Punishments or judgments. Five punishments, five judgments, whatever you want to call them. Death of joy. Death of joy. Do not rejoice. Punishment number two. Exile. Verses three to six. They will not remain in the Lord's land. Ephraim will return to Egypt or captivity or bondage and eat unclean food in Assyria. The food of pagans, the food of Gentiles. They will not pour out wine offerings to the Lord anymore, nor will their sacrifices please him. The sacrifices will be to false gods. Such sacrifices will be to them like the bread of mourners. All who eat them will be unclean. This food will be for themselves. It will not come into the temple of the Lord. What will you do on the day of your appointed feast, on the festival days of the Lord? Even if you escape from destruction, Egypt will gather them and Memphis will bury them. Their treasures of silver will be taken over by briars and thorns will be overrun, will overrun their tents. So essentially, they're, they're going into exile. Their sacrifices are going to be gone. Their offerings are going to be gone. Their worship is going to be gone. They're going to be carried away into captivity. They're going to be in bondage. And all of the things that are special and favorable to them will be lost forever. Punishment number three, or judgment number three, is the loss of discernment. It says in verses, verses seven uh, through nine, the days of punishment are coming, the days of reckoning are at hand. Let Israel know this. Your sins are many, and your hostility so great. You consider the prophet a fool. You consider the man, inspired man, a maniac. They've lost their discernment. They don't know right from wrong. They don't know truth from falseness. They call the lie true. They call wrong right. Loss of discernment. The prophet along with my God is the watchman over Ephraim, yet snares await him on all paths and hostility in the house of his God. 
they have sunk deep into corruption as in the days of Gibeah, God will remember their wickedness and punish them for their sins. And then the next, the next judgment is a declining birth rate. Verse 10, when I found Israel. When did God find Israel? Well, he found Israel with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Jacob's 12 sons and they went into Egypt and God led them out and then God led them to the promised land and turned them into a nation. When I found Israel, it was like finding grapes in the desert. You know what? I am thirsty. It's amazing how just one grape is like a burst of fluid in my mouth. It's a good thing. It's a delightful thing. God said, that's how you were to me. It was like seeing the early fruit on a fig tree. Ah, there's one. But when you came to Baal Peor, read all about that in Numbers 25, they consecrated themselves to that shameful idol and became as vile as the thing they loved. Ephraim's glory will fly away like a bird No birth, no pregnancy, no conception. By the way, that's what God told him exactly what happened in Deuteronomy when Moses was speaking and said, if you turn away from God, this is what's going to happen to you. Deuteronomy 28, verses 58 to 62. Your glory will fly away like a bird. No birth, not even pregnancy, not even conception. And even if you raise children, I will bereave them of every one of them. Woe to them. When I turn away from them, I have seen Ephraim like Tyre, planted in a pleasant place. But Ephraim will bring out their children to the slayer. Give them, O Lord. What will you give them? Give them wounds that miscarry and breasts that are dry because of all their wickedness in Gilgal. I hated them. Because of their sinful deeds, I will drive them out of my house. I will no longer love them. All of their leaders are rebellious. It's a national epidemic. Ephraim is blighted. Their root is withered. They yield no fruit. Even if they bear children, I will slay their cherished offspring. By the way, we're going to see that God's going to do that through the Assyrians. And so then we have the final judgment of chapter 9, and it is rejection. And so let me just remind you, we had the judgment of the death of joy, verses 1 to 2, exile, verses 3 to 6, loss of discernment, or lack of discernment, 7 to 9, declining birth rates, 10 to 16, and then rejection in verse 17. And it says... My God will reject them because they have not obeyed him. They will be wanderers among the nations. And today, to this very day, Israel wanders among the nations. And that's all going to lead to destruction of the nation and the land. And that's what chapter 10 is going to take us into. Reaping what is sown. So Israel was spreading a vine. Israel was a spreading vine. He brought forth fruit for himself. That's, that's where Israel began. A, a, a glorious vine bringing fruit, but bringing fruit for himself. As the fruit increased, prosperity, what did he do with his money? Built more altars, and his land pro as his land prospered, he adorned his sacred stones, false worship. The prosperity led to false worship which leads to being guilty. Verse 2, their heart is deceitful and now they must bear their guilt. And we're going to deal with the altars. The Lord will demolish their altars and destroy their sacred stones. And then we're going to deal with the king. They will say we have no king because we did not revere the Lord. But even if we had a king, what could he do for us exactly? They lost their king. Their, king, their final king is put to death. The northern kingdom ended up with no king at all. 
But even had Israel had a king, the king could not save them. And then we're going to talk about false promises. They make many promises, take false oaths, make agreements. Therefore, lawsuits spring up like poisonous weeds in the plowed field. That's how they treat one another. And destruction awaits. The people who live in Samaria fear the calf idol of Beth Aven. Remember Beth El, the house of God, became Beth Aven, where the, the calf was worshipped. Its people will mourn over it, so will its idolatrous priests. Isn't that interesting? They're mourning the loss of their calf idol. Those who had rejoiced over its splendor because it is taken from them into exile. It will be carried, by the way, you can read about this in 2 Kings 15 and 17. It will be carried to Assyria as tribute for the great king, the king of Assyria. Ephraim will be disgraced. Israel will be ashamed of its wooden idols. Samaria and his king will float away like a twig on the surface of the waters. The high places, this is what Assyria is going to do. The high places of wickedness will be destroyed. It is the sin of Israel. Thorns and thistles will grow up and cover their altars. They will say to the mountains, cover us and to the hills, fall on us. Since the days of Gibeah, remember Gibeah is in Benjamin, and you can read about this, this event in Judges 19 through 20. And Gibeah was the place where the Levite cut up his concubine into 12 pieces and sent her out to the tribes. Since the days of that awful sin, O Israel, and there you have remained. There you take your stand. You take your stand in the place of sin. Since those days of Gibeah, you have sinned, and there you stand. Didn't that war overtake the evildoers of Gibeah? The other tribes sent in troops, and they destroyed them for this. But sin wasn't destroyed. God says in verse 10, When I please, I will punish them. Nations will be gathered against them and put them in bonds for their double sin. Ephraim is a trained heifer that loves to thresh. So I'll put a yoke on her fair neck. I will drive Ephraim. Judah must plow. And Jacob must break up the ground. I'm going to turn you into nothing more than a slave. Nothing more than a work animal, an animal of a burden. Verse 12, sow for yourselves righteousness, reap the fruit of unfailing love, and break up your unplowed ground, for it's time to seek the Lord until he comes and showers righteousness on you. But you have planted wickedness, you have reaped evil, you have eaten the fruit of deception. Because you have depended on your own strength and on your many warriors. The roar of battle will rise up against your people so that all your fortresses will be devastated as Shalman devastated Beth Arbel on the day of the battle. Now let me just tell you this, that Shalman is a shortened version, shortened, uh, version of Shalmaneser. And Shalmaneser was the king of Assyria that in 740 BC came into Israel to Beth Arbel in Galilee and there was a great defeat of Israel there at that time. And God is saying, you know what? With, you're depending on yourself, you're depending on your strength, you're depending on all, uh, all your own things. And here's what's going to happen. Just the battle, roar of battle will rise up against you and it's going to be like the day of Shalmaneser. You're going to be destroyed. Look at what it says. When mothers were dashed to the ground with their children. You see the earlier chapter and that, that um, a prophecy of no children Thus it will happen to you, O Bethel, O house of God, because your wickedness is great. When that day dawns, the king of Israel will be completely destroyed. Chapter 11. Wow, what harsh language we've had. The destruction of Israel. But now we come to chapter 11. 
and God hasn't given up on them. Israel will be restored. And chapters 11 to 14, the end of the book, basically talk to us of the restoration of Israel, but not exclusively. We're still going to go back and be reminded of sin and destruction, okay? But let's take a look at this. Let's wrap up the book. Chapter 11, verse 1. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called him my son. And God is going to use two analogies here to show his love. When I called you as a child, when I called you out of Egypt, you are my son. I loved you. Verse 2, the more I called, the more I called Israel, the further they went from me. They sacrificed to the Baals. They burnt incense to the images. So, image number one, or, or analogy number one, is God is a father to them. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by the arms. But they did not realize it was I who healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. And then we have the analogy of a farmer. I lifted the yoke from their neck. I bent down to feed them. So God taught you to walk. God healed you. God lifted the yoke of captivity and bondage off of your neck. God bent down to feed you. You were out in the wilderness. You had no food. You had no water. God gave it to you even as a farmer takes care of his herds. But they refuse to repent. Will they not return to Egypt, to bondage, to captivity? Will not Assyria rule over them this time because they refuse to repent? Swords are going to flash in their cities. Will destroy the bars in their gates and put an end to their plans. You think you're safe. You have your big walls. You have your big gates. You have your... Iron bars? No. Verse 7, My people are determined to turn on me even if they call to the Most High. He will by no means exalt them because they don't cry out sincerely. But look at God's love. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? And let's look at this permanently or eternally. How can I treat you like Adma? How can I make you like Zobaim? My heart is changed within me. All my compassion is aroused. Now, who is Adma and Zobim? Well, Adma and Zobim were two cities along with Sodom and Gomorrah that were destroyed in Abraham's day. It wasn't just Sodom and Gomorrah that was destroyed, okay? I think there were five cities. Uh, four or five, I can't remember for sure. But Zobim and Adma were two of the cities destroyed right along with Sodom and Gomorrah. And God is saying, I can't treat you like that. Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zobim are no more. We don't even know for sure where they were. There are no traces of them. God says, I, I cannot wipe you out permanently for everlasting times. I'm compassionate. Verse 9, I will not carry out my fierce anger, nor will I turn and devastate Ephraim for I am God and not a man. I don't act like man. I'm God. The Holy One among you. I will not come in wrath. They will follow the Lord. He will roar like a lion. When he roars, his children will come trembling from the west. There's a day God will call and his people will return. They will come trembling like birds from Egypt from captivity, like doves from Assyria bondage. I will settle them in their homes, declares the Lord. God will return his people to the land. So then we have Israel's sin. Ephraim has surrounded me with lies. The house of Israel, by the way, chapter 12 should begin right here. In, in, in chapter 11, 12, that should really be 12, 1. Ephraim has surrounded me with lies. The house of Israel with deceit. And Judah is unruly against God, even against the faithful Holy One. Ephraim feeds on the wind. He pursues the east wind all day and multiplies lies and violence. He makes a treaty with Assyria and sends olive oil to Egypt. The Lord has a, and by the way, that's talking about 
they're, they're paying tribute for the right to survive and live at this particular point. The Lord has a charge to bring against Judah. He will punish Jacob according to his ways and repay him according to his deeds. In the womb, he grasped his brother's heel, a reference to Jacob and his, his brother Esau. As a man, he struggled with God. So in the womb, he grasped his brother's heel, Genesis 25, 26. As a man, he struggled with God, Genesis 32, 28. That was at Peniel. He struggled with the angel and overcame him, Genesis 32, 26. And he wept and begged for his favor. He found him at Bethel, Genesis 28, and talked with him there. The Lord God Almighty, the Lord is his name of renown. Return, return, return. There should be a heart in your Bible right here. Verse 6, but you must return to your God. Maintain love and justice and wait for your God. Always. Always. The merchant uses dishonest scales. He loves to defraud. That's how you are. Ephraim boasts, I'm very rich. I've become wealthy. With all my wealth, they will not find me. In me, any iniquity. With all my wealth, they will not find in me any iniquity or sin. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. So we have kind of a discussion. The merchant uses dishonest scales. Ephraim boasts, I am rich. I am wealthy. With all my wealth, the enemy isn't going to find me. With my iniquity, with my sin, I'm still okay because I'm wealthy. And God answers, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. I will make you live in tents again, as in the days of your appointed feasts. I spoke to the prophets, gave them my visions, and told parables through them. Is Gilead, the city of refuge, wicked? Yes. Its people are worthless. Do they sacrifice bulls in Gilgal where the standing stones were by the Jordan? Yes. Their altars will be like piles of stone on a plowed field. Jacob fled to the country of Aram. Up north. Israel served to get a wife. Aram is, Jacob went, it's the Fertile Crescent. So Jacob went probably around the Fertile Crescent, came to Mesopotamia, which is, begins, the Tigris and Euphrates begin north of Israel, as it were. So Jacob fled to the country of Aram. Israel served to get a wife, Israel, Jacob, same person, and to pay for her, he tended sheep. The Lord used a prophet, Moses, to bring Israel from Egypt by a prophet he cared for him. But Ephraim had bitterly provoked him to anger. His Lord will leave him the guilt of his bloodshed and will repay him for his contempt. And so we have destruction in chapter 13. When Ephraim spoke, men trembled. He was exiled in Israel, but he became guilty of Baal worship and died. Now they sin no more. Now, excuse me, now they sin more and more. They make idols for themselves from their silver. Cleverly fashioned images, all of them the work of craftsmen. It is said of these people, they offer human sacrifice and kiss calf idols. Wow, the ways of the pagan nations around you. Therefore, they will be like the morning mist, the early dew that disappears, the chaff swirling from the threshing floor like smoke escaping through a window. Poof! You will be gone. Verse 4, But I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. You shall acknowledge no God but me, no Savior except me. I cared for you in the desert in the land of burning heat. I, when I fed them, they were satisfied. When they were satisfied, they became proud. And they forgot me. So I will come upon them like a lion. Like a leopard, I will lurk, lurk by the path. Like a bear, robbed of her cubs, I will attack them and rip them open. Like a lion, I will 
devour them. A wild animal will tear them apart. Destruction is coming upon you because God took care of you. God provided for you and you forgot him. Verse 9, you are destroyed, destroyed, O Israel, because you are against me, against your helper. Where is your king that he may save you? Where are your rulers that rule all your towns? Of whom you said, give me a king and princes. So in my anger, I gave you a king. And in my wrath, I took him away. The guilt of Ephraim is stored up. His sins are kept on record. Pains as a woman in childbirth come to him. But he is a child without wisdom. When the time comes, he does not come to the opening of the womb. But, but God, folks. And here, put a heart in your Bible. I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. Where, O death, are your plagues? Where, O grave or shield, is your destruction? God's heart, God's compassion. God still loves his people. God will ransom, God will redeem. God will deliver. God will give life. <clears throat> and ends that verse 14, I will have no compassion even though he thrives among his brothers. And his wind from the Lord will come, blowing in from the desert. His spring will fail and his well dry up. His storehouse will be plundered of all its treasures. The people of Samaria must bear their guilt because they have rebelled against their God. They will fall by the sword. Their little ones will be dashed to the ground. Their pregnant women ripped open. Wow, so God says, I will save you, but not before the destruction comes. Chapter 14. God calls upon his people to do three things. To convert, to confess their sins, and to be contrite. Chapter 14, verse 1. Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God. Your sins have been your downfall. Convert. Confess. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, forgive all our sins and receive us graciously that we may offer the fruit of our lips. Assyria can't save us. We will not mount war horses. This is contrition. Be contrite in your heart. We will never again say, our gods do what our hands have made. For in you, the fatherless find compassion. Put a heart in your Bible right there. I will heal their waywardness. Put a heart in your Bible right there. And love them freely. Heart. For my anger has turned away from them. A heart. I will be like the dew to Israel. He will blossom like a lily. Like a cedar of Lebanon, he will send down his roots and his young shoots will grow. His splendor will be like an olive tree, his fragrance like a cedar of Lebanon. Men may dwell again in the shade. He will flourish like the grain. He will blossom like a vine and his fame will be like the wine of Lebanon. O Israel, what more have I to do with idols? I will answer him and care for him. I am like a green pine tree. Your faithfulness comes from me. So, God begins this chapter, or Hosea begins this chapter, saying, convert, confess your sins, and be contrite in your heart. And then God gives this loving response, I will heal, verse 4, I will love, verse 4b. I will refresh, verse 5. I will restore, verse 6. I will protect, verse 7. And I will answer, verse 8. And the book concludes 
it might help us if the word was there, but it isn't. Because we just read these, this one verse. Who is wise? He will realize these things. Who is discerning? He will understand them. The ways of the Lord are right. The righteous walk in them, but the rebellious stumble in them. And so maybe we could conclude with the word choose. Choose. Just like Joshua concluded his life ministry warfare with a call to Israel choose you this day whom you will follow Hosea's ending with a challenge who is wise he'll realize the destruction he'll realize these things who's discerning he'll realize I am speaking to you the truth God's ways are right and the righteous walk in those ways but the rebellious stumble which way will you choose which way will you go for Israel they chose the wrong way and the nation came to an end in the year 722 BC the Assyrians swooped down like an eagle a leopard a bear a lion the nation was destroyed, the people were taken captive, and they were dispersed and are dispersed to this very day. The hope of Hosea, salvation, is that God will restore. I have hope, hope that this has maybe given you a quick overview of the book and an understanding. And as you go back and study and read, cross-reference that you will enjoy more than you ever have before.